Friends, welcome to the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. I'm Reverend Dr. Sarah Johnson, Senior Pastor at New York Avenue, and I am delighted to be with you to welcome you to tonight McClendon Scholar in Residence Program. The McClendon Scholar in Residence Program is a part of our church's commitment to the belief that the life of the mind is also a part of the life of faith. The program brings scholars and thought leaders to the district and to New York Avenue to share their learning, their wisdom, their insight about how our church can be more effective in its work for justice as we seek to follow Jesus Christ in the city and the world. The program was established through the vision and generosity of the Reverend Dr. Jack E. McClendon, who served as an associate pastor at the church from 1957 to 1991 and grows out of Dr. McClendon's belief and the Presbyterian Church's commitment that justice, service, and action are sustained when a community works to deepen its faith in conversation with the profound issues of the day. Tonight's program falls squarely within that lasting vision as we welcome Dr. Kristen Coves dumay to share her insights and her scholarship on the connections between American evangelicalism, toxic masculinity, and the rise of Christian nationalism. A crucial conversation here in the United States and around the globe, even in this moment. As we prepare to begin tonight's program, please join with me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. God of justice and mercy, we thank you for the opportunity to gather this night to listen and to learn together. Open our hearts and our minds to listen for your voice that in word and deed, we will come to know you more deeply and follow you more faithfully in the world. Amen. Good evening, I'm glad to have you with us. Uh, I'm Theo Brown, a director of the McClendon Scholar Program and uh, want to add my welcome to that of uh, Sarah's. Uh, we're glad to have you with us, whether you are, this is the first time you've joined one of our programs or whether you've been with us for many in the past. Uh, this is our 16th year of conducting programs under uh, uh, the McClendon Scholar Program. And I know many of you are veterans, uh, some of you going way back to some of the early programs and uh, others have found about us out about us more recently. We're delighted to have all of you take some time to join us tonight. Uh, in the two years since the pandemic uh, hit, we have been hosting a variety of webinars online. Uh, we're gonna continue to have webinars in the future, but we're also hoping to go back to some in-person programs and have a combination of that. And you'll be hearing more about that as uh, we go on along uh, later in the program. Um, we've been blessed to have a wide variety of really excellent uh, Christian thought leaders uh, in these webinars recently, um, including names such as James Lawson, uh, the civil rights uh, hero, Krista Tippett, uh, William Barber, E.J. Dion, uh, Catherine Hayhoe, Corinna Gore, James Foreman Jr., many others. And um, you can learn more about our program on the church website uh, in yapc.org, you click on McClendon Scholar and it lists all of the programs and there are also recordings there of almost all the programs uh, we've had. Um, now, after all these time as online meetings, um, most of you are familiar by now about how a webinar works or a Zoom meeting works, but I just wanna point out a couple of things as we begin our time together uh, to note both the chat button at the bottom and the Q&A. Uh, now, these are different and should be used differently this evening. And at a couple of times, I'll invite you to type into chat. And then later on, I'll give some instructions about typing in questions for Dr. DeMay that you can uh, uh, raise that I will ask on your behalf uh, later uh, in the program. Um, but to start with, I invite you to go to chat. We like to see where people are from and who's here. So if you click on chat, uh, it will open up and we invite you to type in where you are. Um, are you tuning in from somewhere in the DC area or somewhere around the country? At our last uh, program, we had people from 20 
different states. And I imagine there's some of that tonight. I see Pennsylvania and Virginia and California, North Carolina, Tennessee. You might enjoy looking through the list and seeing the range of places represented tonight. Um, so continue to type that in if you want. If you're with a particular congregation, you might let us know that or organization also. Now, before we hear from Dr. DeMay, I, I wanna take a moment to get your input uh, in another way. I'm, I'm gonna ask a couple of polling questions. Now, we've not used polls before in our webinars, but they're a good way to get feedback from those of you who are participating. And we wanna use them tonight to get a sense of who's in our audience. Since tonight's program focuses on a specific segment of American Christianity, we want to get a sense of the religious background and affiliation of those of you who have signed on. So we have two questions. Um, the first one, um, if we can bring it up now, is this general question about religious affiliation. Um, click one that is most applicable for you. What is your religious affiliation? Um, since we're a Presbyterian church, I put Presbyterians first and uh, you see Baptists and AME and uh, other Protestant. I apologize to my uh, Lutheran and Methodist and uh, Episcopal and many other denominational friends for lumping you as other Protestant, but we just don't have enough space for all. Then Catholic, Jewish, some other religion. And if you have no religious affiliation, and I imagine that's true of several of you, um, please just click that and that is uh, fine too. But if you would do that right now, click one and then hit submit. And then we'll wait just a minute to see and learn a little bit more about our uh, those of you who are with us tonight um, and your affiliation. Look at the, uh, some of you are typing it in the chat and that's good to see, but please also click it on the poll that is showing up on your screen uh, at this time. Give just a few more seconds and then uh, for you to click uh, which of these. Uh, and again, I couldn't list everything. You may just have to put other religion or something closest to where you are. Um, so um, let's um, close the polling right now. Let's see what uh, the results are here from uh, tonight. All right, so you get a sense here. Um, other Protestant is very heavy, 40% uh, and that lumps all those groups. You see about 32% of us are Presbyterian, about almost 10%, 9% Baptist, and then a smattering of others and 7% uh, and, uh, saying no affiliation, you can see yourself. So that gives us a sort of interesting uh, look at our broad religious affiliation. Um, the second question um, is more about the topic of the evening. We're gonna be looking at white evangelical uh, Christianity. And I want to ask you a question about uh, how familiar are you with the white evangelical tradition? And here are some choices. Again, you just have to choose the one that's most appropriate for you. If you consider yourself uh, an evangelical, you're a uh, white evangelical, then click that. Uh, maybe you were raised a white evangelical, but no longer are um, Maybe you were raised in an evangelical family, and so you know a lot about the evangelical tradition, but maybe it was Hispanic or African-American uh, or Asian-American. Click that. Uh, you have many close friends who are white evangelicals. Maybe you only know a few people who are evangelicals, know mostly about the tradition from the media, and maybe you know almost nothing. So click the one, again, most appropriate for you just trying to get a sense as we enter into this topic, uh, how familiar you are with the white evangelical tradition we'll be talking about tonight. Okay, be sure to click one and submit your answers. And let's see what we have in that regard. Okay, um, so we have almost 20% of the group who identify as white evangelicals or were raised in a white evangelical family. Uh, and then 19% um, have many close family and friends. Um, and uh, almost half of the group, uh, interesting to note, 
clicked. I only know a few white evangelicals and mostly know uh, from media. So that plus the last one means almost 60%, 58% of us say we really just don't know much about white evangelicals. Thank you. That's very helpful to get a sense of where we are on this topic as, uh, as we talk about it. So now tonight's program marks a, a new and a sort of um, sort of new series of programs we're going to be doing where we're going to feature authors of notable books that we think it's important for uh, those connected to the McClendon Scholar Program to know about. And we're delighted to have Dr. Kristen Dumay initiate the series uh, with a discussion of her best-selling book, uh, Jesus and John Wayne. Uh, this book has received a lot of attention. Uh, and, and I know some of you have read it and others of you have really been looking forward to hearing from Dr. Dumay. So here's how we'll proceed this evening. In just a moment, uh, uh, our pastor, Reverend Sarah Johnson, uh, will introduce Dr. Demay. Then she'll make some opening remarks about her book uh, and the main points in it, and also some of the reactions she's received to it in the time period since it was released in, in 2020. After that, I'll engage Dr. Demay in a discussion, um, ask her some questions, that I have, and then from reading the book, and then some that have been suggested to me. Some of you sent questions to me in advance, and I'll be sharing some of those. And then with a good amount of time, we hope maybe 20 minutes or so remaining, I'll invite you to type in to the Q&A questions you have, and I'll, we'll cover as many of those as we can uh, in the time that uh, remains. Um, I would ask you to wait to type in questions in the Q&A, uh, until um, after uh, uh, Dr. Dumay speaks, or at least well into her talk, I suggest you think about a good question, maybe even write it down somewhere, uh, and then wait and near the end, type in your question, and I'll signal the time for you to do that. The more you do that, the more they'll be bunched together, and, and we can see uh, which questions have come in. You also can vote for the ones you like, uh, and sort of support questions that you want us uh, to read. Uh, so again, I'll invite you to do that later. But if you have chat comments or something you want to say in the meantime, please do that in chat. And those of you who are interested can follow that and see the comments there. But keep Q&A for questions uh, for Dr. DeMay that we'll have during the question period. Okay, we are looking forward to our uh, uh, hearing from Dr. DeMay and our discussion with her. And I now want to welcome Reverend Sarah Johnson again to have her introduce uh, Dr. Kristen Dumay. Thank you, Theo. Tonight we are indeed thrilled to welcome Dr. Kristen Cobes Dumay to speak with us about her book, Jesus and John Wayne, How White and Evangelicals corrupted a faith and fractured a nation. If you have had a chance to read a little bit about Dr. DeMay in preparation for tonight's event, you know that she is a writer and a speaker and a scholar who explores the intersection between religion, gender, and politics. An academic by training, she holds a PhD in U.S. history from the University of Notre Dame while seeking to connect wisdom and scholarship of the academy with popular audiences. Her bylines include many well-known publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Daily Beast, Religion and Politics, Religion News Service, Christian Century, and Christianity Today, just to name a few. Dr. Dumay's work has also garnered extensive national attention and international attention. You may have listened to her or heard an interview with her on NPR's Morning Edition, the BBC, and countless national outlets across the globe. She is also a frequent commentator on religion and politics in the national media, and as a speaker has appeared in colleges, universities, and scholarly institutions across the country. Dr. Dumay currently teaches at Calvin University and lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan with her husband, their three children, and their dog named Paco. Please join me in welcoming the brilliant and thoughtful Dr. Dumay to New York Avenue Presbyterian Church and to tonight's program. We're so glad to have you.
Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, Theo, and, and uh, to your church community. I have to say it warms my heart uh, to see a church that does uh, value the life of the mind as you do. And, and so it is absolutely a privilege for me to be with you here tonight. Um, I thought I'd, I'd jump right in and uh, the, the polling questions are really helpful up front uh, because I suppose uh, I should start with the question of, am I an evangelical? I'll start there and I'll, I'll work my way around to a definition in a, in a little bit. This is always the question that I expect and dread uh, when I give any interview, especially if it's an interview where time is tight because it, it takes a while for me to explain. Um, I never identified as an evangelical growing up. I grew up in a conservative Christian home in a Dutch immigrant community in Northwest Iowa. My dad was a theology professor and ordained minister in the Christian Reformed Church. And uh, I grew up identifying over against American evangelicals. We in the Christian Reformed community uh, thought we were smarter than evangelicals and, and better than, than evangelicals in pretty much every way. Uh, so I didn't identify as an evangelical. That said, the Christian Reformed Church is technically a member of the National Association of Evangelicals. And so technically I can be placed in that bucket. Uh, I should also say that in growing up, even though my theological tradition that I was raised in is distinct from kind of mainstream evangelicalism. I did grow up with a pretty big dose of evangelical popular culture. So we had one bookstore in my small town in Iowa, and it was a Christian bookstore. And the books that lined the shelves were all uh, put out by evangelical publishers. I grew up listening to the Christian radio station because I believed that the top 40 was sinful and I wanted to be a good Christian. And so looking back, I can see that although I didn't identify as an evangelical, I was in some ways immersed in this evangelical popular culture. So that's kind of my background and it'll become relevant as we go. Uh, let me start with Jesus and John Wayne, the origins of this particular book. I was a new faculty member. We have to go way back. I've been at Calvin for 18 years now. My first or second year at Calvin, I uh, and Calvin is in the tradition in which I was raised, this, this Christian Reformed tradition, Dutch immigrant. Uh, my first, uh, one of my first semesters there, I was teaching a course in US history. And I wanted to introduce my students in the survey course to the concept of gender and how gender worked in history, because growing up in a conservative space, the only exposure I had to gender issues was whether women could serve as as uh, ordained ministers, elders or deacons. And in my church, the answer to all of the above was no. And that was about all that I, I knew as far as gender went. And when I got went, got to graduate school, uh, my first semester, I was introduced to the academic study of gender and women's history, and it totally blew my mind. I was fascinated that week. I changed my course of study from intellectual and religious history to religious history and gender, and I really haven't looked back. And what was so fascinating to me is how I came to see that gender and gender roles didn't just reflect biblical values, uh, but they reflected uh, economic shifts and they were connected to uh, race and to foreign policy and uh, into war and all sorts of things. And I was just fascinated. And again, that ideas of masculinity and, and femininity can change over time. And to always ask how power is, uh, is a part of that. And so I, I embraced that, uh, wrote my first, uh, wrote my dissertation and my first book on Christian feminism, kind of a, a self-examination in some ways. And then I, I was there at Calvin. And uh, in that class, I decided to lecture on Teddy Roosevelt because Roosevelt is such a great example of this, right? How masculinity changes over time. And he embodies this new masculinity in the early 20th century and it's rugged and it's aggressive and it's very white and it's linked to foreign policy and you know, the rough riders and so on. And, and it was just this great little snapshot. So I gave that lecture thought it went pretty well. And then afterwards, a couple of guys from that class came up to me and said, Professor Dumay, there is a book that you have got to read. And they told me about this book, John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. 
Now, because um, more than half of you are not super familiar with evangelicalism, with white evangelicalism, I'm going to have to introduce this book a little bit. But if this were uh, an audience of evangelicals, there would be no need because pretty much everybody read this book in the early 2000s. Uh, and it sold more than 4 million copies. Uh, my church was doing book studies. Uh, all the guys in the dorms were doing book studies, right? Really big deal. This, again, it came out in 2001, but 2005, 2006 is when I, I, I didn't just first hear about it, but I had heard about it and thought, yeah, that's not for me. Uh, discovering the secret of a man's soul, I'll pass. Uh, and then I decided uh, to listen to my students like, okay, let me go check this out. So I drove down to Family Christian Bookstore here in Grand Rapids, bought a copy for $20, opened it up, and there uh, was a quote from Teddy Roosevelt right up front. And I, I kept reading and I saw how this, this book on Christian manhood what presented a vision of masculinity that wasn't really drawing on the Christian scriptures much at all. Instead, Eldridge was drawing on Hollywood heroes on um, not actually John Wayne, that comes later, but on uh, his favorite was uh, William Wallace from the movie Braveheart, uh, Mel Gibson's William Wallace, uh, kind of based his, his vision of Christian manhood on that character. Uh, he also loved Teddy Roosevelt and General Patton and General MacArthur and random cowboys and uh, soldiers, right? This very heroic rugged and violent vision of masculinity. Uh, as Aldridge put it, uh, God is a warrior God. Men are made in his image. Every man has a battle to fight. Now, again, this was around 2005, 2006. What else was going on right around then? It was the early years of the Iraq war. And I was seeing all this survey data come my way, showing how white evangelicals were outliers, far and away more likely to support the Iraq war than any other American demographic, uh, more likely to support preemptive war in general, to condone the use of torture, to embrace aggressive foreign policy, right? And, and I just asked what historians of gender have been trained to ask, what might one of these things have to do with the other? And so I started looking deeper. And what I realized is that this was just the tip of the iceberg. There were dozens of books on Christian manhood that evangelical publishers were churning out. And they were almost identical. This was such a bestseller. It was, it was, it was a, a, a clear formula and all these other books. It was, they were essentially plagiarized very close because the same cast of characters, Teddy Roosevelt and William Wallace, very big and General Patton and MacArthur. And then every once in a while you get Robert E. Lee in there too. And, and then John Wayne, I started seeing John Wayne popping up too. And, and, um, and this is also the height of the Mark Driscoll era. If you know anything about Mark Driscoll, uh, the pastor out in Seattle's Mars Hill church, and he was extreme. He was all about masculinity and manhood. And he was deeply misogynistic and he was crass and he was belligerent and he was all the rage in evangelical spaces. And so I spent a year and a half researching this. And then I set it aside for a few reasons. Uh, one, even though I knew how wildly popular these guys were, when I was reading their material. When I was watching Driscoll's sermons, it felt extremist to me. It felt fringe, to be honest. And I'm a Christian. And, and I had this nagging question of, as a person of faith, should I be shining what uh, you know, a bright light on what may well be the darkest underbelly of American Christianity here? And especially if they are fringe, right? do they warrant this? And plus it was really disturbing. And I wasn't sure I wanted to spend the years of my life that it would require. Uh, and so I ended up setting the project aside. I also had to finish my first book. I had a baby and then I had another baby surprisingly. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, maybe I'll come back to that at some point. Fast forward to the fall of 2016. I was actually working on a different project on the religious formation of Hillary Clinton, um, drawing on the research for my first book, where I looked at a lot of progressive Methodist uh, women and, and Hillary Clinton is as Methodist as they come, right? She's so firmly in the tradition of progressive Methodist women that uh, I was I was working on that project. And so I was watching the primary season very closely. Uh, and I started to see already in 2015, the attraction of white evangelicals towards Donald Trump. And this didn't start from the top down, didn't start with the national leadership. 
It started at the grassroots. Already in August 2015, the first survey data comes out showing this affinity. And, uh, and then we saw that support grow over time. By January of 2016, we see some leaders uh, start to support Trump, Jerry Falwell Jr. and Robert Jeffress among the first. And then we just see that support continue to grow. Uh, until we get to October of 2016. By that point, it's clear evangelicals had absolutely thrown their support behind Trump, helped him secure the nomination. And then we had the release of the Access Hollywood tape. You probably remember. And this just focused the nation's attention on this pressing question. How could evangelicals, the family values voters, the moral majority, support a man like Donald Trump. We have him now on camera admitting to assaulting women, right? Uh, surely, surely, right? They're, they're going to they're, they're gonna fall away. One or two wavered ever so briefly, prayed about it, and then we're right back behind him within uh, by the week's end. Uh, and, and so that's when this clicked for me. That's when it clicked. Because when I said I'd put the project aside, I hadn't forgotten about it and I hadn't stopped paying attention. And in the ensuing decade, I saw one after another of the men who had been promoting this militant Christian masculinity become embroiled in scandal, uh, abusive power and sexual abuse, either directly as perpetrators or indirectly as supporters of their friends who are perpetrators. And I kept tabs on this. I, I kept a file. And when I saw the reaction of evangelicals to uh, the Access Hollywood tape, it, it clicked. And I thought, we've seen this before. We have seen this before. And I thought about that research I had done a decade earlier. And I realized that the media was getting it wrong and that many evangelical observers, especially the never Trump evangelicals were getting it wrong. Uh, when they were framing this as a, a, a question of betrayal, how could evangelicals betray their values to support a man like Donald Trump? I knew that if you look to this history, if you look to this literature, God is a warrior God and men are made in his image. God filled men with testosterone so that they would be aggressive so that they can fight, fight to defend faith, family, and nation. And you want that aggression. You need that aggression as a gift of God and boys will be boys and testosterone comes with certain side effects. But I heard that same language that I had seen in these books in terms of support for Trump. Evangelicals said themselves, he is our ultimate fighting champion. He will not be cowed by political correctness. He will do what needs to be done. So I wrote this. I wrote a little essay, published it in Religion and Politics, nicely timed to Trump's inauguration. And, um, and, and that went viral. And uh, I, I knew I was onto something. I felt like it was such a clear answer, but it was really the comments. I know you're not supposed to read comments and online pieces, but I did. And the comments were fascinating because I saw so many men comment on that saying, I'm an evangelical or I was an evangelical. And this is exactly right. I just got this confirmation. Or there are people saying, yeah. And what's the problem? Of course we want a manly man. So at that point I decided, okay, I need to, I need to turn this into a book. And then I had to uh, decide a couple of things. As a, a historian, it's always a, a dilemma to figure out where to start. Um, and uh, I totally thought the story really gets going in the 1960s and 70s, but you have to go to the 40s and then really the 20s and then the 19th century. So uh, I, I, I cover that qu uh, quickly, uh, the earlier stages, then really jump in in the 1940s. But I also had this question of um, what is an evangelical, really? I was going to save this for the end, but I think I, I need to put it up front because of the, the survey question. So scholars have a very handy definition of an evangelical, and I had fully intended to use that definition and just plop it into my introduction like every other scholar seemed to do. And let me tell you what that is. It's four points. Uh, and it was uh, kind of coined by a British historian of evangelicalism, David Bebbington. And so it's known for history nerds. Um, as the Bebbington quadrilateral, okay, four points. And these four points are uh, biblicism, so the centrality of the scriptures and the authority of the scriptures, uh, crucicentrism, the centrality of the cross, atonement and so forth, uh, conversionism, 
born again experience, and then activism uh, or evangelism. So you're acting out of these faith commitments. Okay. And so that is the definition of evangelicalism. When I was looking at, when I was researching this, I started to realize that, um, that the, um, the definition didn't really capture what uh, I see a note that I'm, I'm speaking a little quickly, so I'll try to slow this down. Um, I, it didn't really capture the, um, the evangelicalism that I was seeing because many evangelicals don't, um, don't know a lot of theology. Evangelical surveys come out uh, and, and uh, evangelical leaders are aghast at the theological illiteracy of evangelicals. In fact, surveys show that many evangelicals hold I ideas that would count as heresy. And in my own encounters with evangelicals, I, uh, I realized that there's so much to being an evangelical that doesn't really get at theology, especially if you go to say women's Bible studies where you'll get together and do a lot of things. And there are lots of cultural expectations, but very little theology there. And so I started wondering if there's this theological illiteracy, why are we defining evangelicalism according to theology? But it really came to the fore around questions of race. Because if you use that theological rubric, then uh, the majority of black Protestants in this country check off those boxes. So they count as evangelicals. The problem is the vast majority of black Protestants who check off those boxes don't identify as evangelical at all because it is clear to them that there is so much more to being an evangelical than checking off those boxes, right? And so I came to see evangelicalism as a cultural movement more than as a theology. Theology is not insignificant. It plays a role, it pops up, but it is not the defining feature of evangelicalism. Instead, I came to see evangelicalism in terms of networks and alliances. And if you spend time in evangelical spaces, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. So we've got some denominations like the Southern Baptist Convention, right? And we've got some um, uh, you know, broader denominations. But evangelicalism has never historically been contained within denominations. We also have these parachurch organizations, all kinds of them, hundreds of them. And we've got these kind of conference circuits, things like the Gospel Coalition. Uh, and you've got publishers, so Crossway and Lifeway Christian Books and all of these things. You've got media. You've got focus on the family and Christian radio, and you've got the Christian film industry. And I came to see that to be an evangelical is, I think back to my own biography here, to be immersed in the consumer culture of evangelicalism. And so it doesn't really come down to what are your theological beliefs necessarily, but how deeply have you been immersed in this evangelical consumer culture? Uh, and for some people, it's just dabbling. You know, you may have read a book here or there. Um, for others, it's total immersion and in some cases, isolation within that subculture. When we see evangelicalism as a consumer culture in this way, we can also see how it is not just contained to evangelical churches and it is not limited its influence to, to those who self-identify as evangelicals. It spills over into the mainline. And some of you may be able to attest to that if you come from mainline uh, spaces, because many members of mainline churches are very much exposed to this evangelical popular culture. Many mainline churches use books for their ministries from evangelical publishers. Their parishioners are listening to Christian radio, Christian music, right? And so they're being exposed. When we see evangelicalism as a consumer culture, we can also see how it um, uh, spills over national boundaries as well. And so we see the export of this uh, American white evangelicalism globally. And I can speak uh, more to that later. Anyway, so I end up um, needing to define that. And that's very important. And that really uh, explains how this history of evangelicalism is very different from many others that have come before and why it connects so viscerally with ordinary evangelicals who have lived this history. Uh, so 
so that's a bit of the background. Um, very quickly, I'll kind of sketch uh, the historical trajectory, but essentially what I end up doing is through the lens of this popular culture, as well as a more traditional history, I show how in the Cold War era, the uh, ideas of gender and militarism, of, of masculinity and militarism become intertwined. Uh, evangelicals embrace anti-communism and gender traditionalism at the same time. And those are linked because we needed strong men to defend Christian America. Communism was anti-God, anti-family and anti-American, all of the things evangelicals held dear thing is they weren't that different from many other Americans at that time in the early Cold War era. This was the leave it to beaver era. This was the uh, you know, consensus era. All of that changes in the 1960s. That's when you have the civil rights movement disrupting the status quo, particularly for Southern white evangelicals. Uh, and you have the feminist movement challenging this gender traditionalism. And you have the Vietnam War and the anti-war movement. And so all of a sudden, evangelicals who had really in the 1940s and 50s moved into the center of American power uh, through with the help of Billy Graham in and out of the Eisenhower White House, really coming to their into their own, in part because they represented many of the values that were held in common in the 1960s, that gets shattered, that consensus is shattered. And that's when evangelicals cling to these values, but in an oppositional way, not in a way that unites them to other Americans, but in a way that divides them. And if you think about these threats, threats, right? Civil rights, feminism, and the anti-war movement, the solution to all of them is the assertion or reassertion of white patriarchal power. And so we have this move to the center of evangelicals, religious, but also cultural and political identity, right when we see evangelicals moving uh, into their own as a, as a partisan political movement, right, with the uh, political realignment from the 1960s and 70s that we see culminating in the election of Ronald Reagan. And at the heart of this uh, cultural identity is the rugged masculine power. So I trace that in the book. I trace it through the 1990s when end of the Cold War means all of a sudden this is up for grabs again. You have experimentation, you have servant leadership, soft patriarchy, the promise keepers movement. Things are really up for grabs until the pendulum starts to swing back and you have a kind of backlash. And by the late 1990s, you have more and more conservative men calling to ramp up the culture wars because the Cold War might be over, but now we have a war for the soul of America. And we need to get tough again because you don't want softness or tenderness in the trenches. So we need to bring back this warrior masculinity. That is what John Eldridge was channeling. And that book, Eldridge's book, was on the shelves of Christian bookstores across the country when terrorists struck the United States on September 11, 2001. All of a sudden you have this uh, mass appeal of this warrior Christianity. Every man has a battle to fight and it was not metaphorical anymore. And you can just see that's when I first encountered this. That's in the early years of the Iraq war. And you can see how this militant conception of manhood was tightly connected to militarism in terms of foreign policy and to an aggressive stance in terms of culture wars. Uh, so that's the story I trace um, up through the 2000s, uh, the um, Obama presidency heightened the sense of embattlement and the proper response was one of aggression, of preemptive strike and into all of that waltzes Donald J. Trump. And no one could hold a candle to him uh, from the Republican uh, stage at those primaries in terms of aggression, in terms of breaking all of the rules, and in terms of promising to protect Christianity, his words, and do whatever needed to be done. Uh, so that's that's the, the thesis in a nutshell. I'll just give a, a couple of takeaways here before we open it up to questions. I already talked about the defining evangelicalism largely as a popular culture. Um, another question uh, to get uh, to focus again is that early nagging question. 
is this fringe? Is this an extremist movement or is this mainstream? And if you read the book, you'll see that this is a, a question that I keep pushing in different ways. And I'm testing this out. How do we, we have some very fringe characters, Bill Gothard, Douglas Wilson, um, and even you can say Mark Driscoll. And then you have the mainstream folks like James Dobson or John Piper. You've got Christianity Today. And what I do in this book is I show the affinities, the connections between the fringe and the main mainstream evangelical, the respectable evangelicals. And I think that's actually really critical right now as we look at some of the threats to um, or potential threats to American democracy from um, the right wing and and uh, uh, the, the kind of shift towards authoritarianism. Uh, this connection between the mainstream and the fringe within evangelicalism is something that I, I think is uh, is is uh, we is cause for concern. Um, one other thing I will say, um, another thing I discovered in this history was the um, the tendency within evangelical circles and, and uh, organizations to develop a, a kind of culture of deference. Authority was so important. You must show authority to those over you. Um, and women have to have to uh, have to defer to masculine authority, patriarchal authority, right? Submission, children to parents, um, uh, men to their pastors, and pastors to the more important pastors. And you have this very hierarchical ordering of evangelical society uh, or evangelical culture. And what I saw then in the case of um, these scandals, in the case of abuse of power and especially sexual abuse, how that deference to authority contributing to cover, contributed to covering up scandal, to covering up horrific abuses within evangelical spaces. And it turns out these are not aberrations. These are repeated patterns just today or yesterday, I guess it is now news broke of sexual harassment within Christianity today and their organization that went on for a couple of decades, right? And so I decided early on, as I was writing this book, I refused to show deference. The subtitle, the chapter titles, all of that is my attempt to say, I will have no part in this. And um, um, then I'll, I'll just close briefly with uh, then talking about the reception. I did not write this book to woo evangelicals, uh, and I didn't expect to. Much to my surprise, it turns out that evangelicals are the book's biggest fans. Uh, not all evangelicals, I will say that much, but it is evangelicals that have made this book a bestseller. Conservative, white, evangelical, complementarian pastors have embraced this book, again, not all of them, uh, but many saying this is true and this is something that we need to grapple with. And so in the question session, I can talk a little bit about the state of evangelicalism today, the divisions within evangelicalism and, uh, and what that might mean for our future. So I'll wrap it up with that. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Kristen. Lots there to chew on and to pick up on. And um, I'll start by just jumping in with a few questions and then bring in some questions from others as we uh, talk. One of the things you said that was interesting there was how when Trump appeared on the scene, um, the leaders were not for Trump, the leaders of the evangelical movement. It all came from the bottom up. The leaders were all for Ted Cruz or... Marco Rubio or, you know, Jeb Bush or what, what do you make from that? What does that say? Uh, is that a, a product of this uh, uh, sort of uh, biblical ignorance you, you referred to? Or what, what, what is it that, that's going on that, that uh, led this be such a, gra a groundswell for Trump and, and not from the leaders at first? You know, when I when I go back to 2015, which is when we can see the earliest grassroots support for Trump, I think it's important for us to remember that we didn't know who Trump was yet. Right? We were still trying to figure that, that out. All of us. Is this guy serious? Do we take him seriously? And then who is he? And particularly within evangelical circles, they were intrigued. Uh, but there were some very live questions. Wasn't he just a Democrat very recently? 
Um, and yes, he didn't fit the family values mold that they were used to kind of you know, being sold, but also, um, his, you know, what's his view on abortion? Um, that was because up until recently he had been pro-choice. So there was just a lot of open questions. What we can see is they had a lot of other, uh, valid candidates, right? You know, you mentioned Tim Cruz, Tim Cruz is, or Ted Cruz is, is kind of the, the Trump light. I like to think of the p- same people who are attracted to, to Cruz, easy to cross over to, to Trump. He was also, you know, fairly combat, combative Christian nationalists and so on. Um, and so I, what I saw happening is the more evangelicals got to know Trump, particularly on those debate stages in the primaries, as he came out really tough, as he came out, you know, um, just breaking the mold, that's when we saw more and more people fall in behind him as this guy's different. We are tired of politics as usual, and he will protect us. And especially after the kind of frenzied sense of embattlement that their own leaders instigated and just, just stoked during the Obama presidency, he, he was the best guy for the job. And that's where you get these theories of he's God's anointed. Yeah. He doesn't look like a pastor, but we don't need a pastor right now. We need a fighter. Whereas in past years, as I recall, I think there would have been more among evangelicals measuring whether or not Trump was one of them or not, but that seems to have started to not matter at some point. Uh, whether or not, yeah, he's one of them. Um, so I think that uh, there was a lot of um, a lot of work done to address that in different ways. You have somebody like James Dobson who comes out and calls him, oh, he's a baby Christian. So it's all yeah, good. Yeah. It's all good. Right. And so then right away that puts him in this evangelicals love a conversion narrative and anything that happened pre-conversion, no problem. Right. And so so that was very effective early on because you don't want to snuff out this you know, baby Christian faith here. So um, so that was effective. But then you also have from uh, the more charismatic spaces, again, this idea of God's anointed one. This, uh, and so, yeah, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? But, uh, but it works. Um, but then, yeah, you also had people all along saying, we don't care, or, you know, somebody like, or, or, or part of the thesis of the book is they, they, they transform Christianity itself. So Jerry Falwell Jr. is a, a great example of this, where, no, this is what Christianity should look like. It should be tough. It should be aggressive. You know, don't give me that, you know, Mr. Rogers kind of stuff. And so Trump fits right in and it doesn't matter if he, if he doesn't know his theology, it doesn't matter because he, he has this warrior identity and you can see all of those strands at play. Um, for some, some aspects are more appealing than others, but together it, it, it comes, it, it comes together quite powerfully. One of the things I thought about reading your book was that while you write about these um, developments within the white evangelical movement uh, and and certain changes in emphasis that have happened, one of the things that I kept wondering about that in a way isn't part of the story here about how white evangelicals have not changed in that from the 50s or 60s, if you look back, most of them, say Protestant denominations certainly were not questioning patriarchy very much. But when the 60s came along, all the other churches began to question it and and the white evangelical Southern Baptists and others didn't. Is that part of it? They're just defending against change or how do you see that? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, that yeah, certainly the case could be made. And I um, and certainly evangelicals would like to make that case, right? That they are, they are remaining faithful and the rest of American culture is, is, you know, veering off. And, um, and I do think that uh, at first I thought you're actually going to go a different direction with this question, because within evangelicals, like the evangelical evangelicals and the, the critics will say that evangelicalism did change, that it became much more combative that it, it be it embraced Christian nationalism that right things were good in the Billy Graham days and and then things went terribly wrong somewhere more recently um, like in the last five or six years kind of thing right that that's a lot of what I hear inside evangelical spaces right my book really pushes back against that um, particularly around this question of Christian nationalism. 
And in, I mean, Billy Graham, total, you know, all in Christian nationalists. Now you could say evangelicals haven't changed. However, it really depends where you start because we could also go back to the early 20th century, which is where I, I kind of skipped because of time. But I set the stage in the book to show how in, um, let's say in the 19th century, even evangelical views of masculinity uh, were varied and um, really held up this uh, gentlemanly ideal that self-restraint was a sign of Christian manhood, right? And so you see a dramatic change over time. If you, if you, if you take a look, history is going to show change over time, even when traditions claim that they, you know, they've been constant. When you look at World War I, you see that, uh, sure, you had your Billy Sunday, an evangelical preacher who was rah rah war. Um, that was actually a more common stance among liberal Protestants, uh, whereas many conservative Protestants were anti war, they were pacifists. Uh, because, and they were, they rejected the idea that America was a Christian nation because to be a Christian meant your soul was saved. And how could a nation have its soul saved? And besides look how evil the country was. Right. And so it's important to keep these things in mind. Otherwise it feels like, you know, within evangelical spaces, tradition is so important. You can also, I mean, my whole first book is on evangelical feminism in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and, and there are strong traditions of evangelical feminism in American history. Evangelicals who take the Bible seriously, who interpret it as, you know, announcing liberation for women. So, so it's deep, as a historian, I have to ask the question, why the, these interpretations and why in this moment? And so I, 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 most of my work isn't showing continuity as much as disruption. You mentioned um, um, that many of the people who've liked your book the most have been evangelicals. Uh, and like one of the questions I got uh, submitted in advance uh, from Julie uh, M, didn't get a last name, was about white evangelicals who don't buy into this uh, view that you describe and are are they growing in numbers? Uh, what do you see happening? Uh, you know, and, and where are they hearing alternative voices as opposed to the ones you point out? Yeah, so I mean, if we if we think about the numbers of uh, you know, kind of polling data, if we go with that, eighty one percent of white evangelicals voted for Trump, and it's roughly the same from twenty sixteen to twenty twenty, depending on the the survey. Um, that leaves nineteen percent who did not. And I have not seen, I've been watching closely, reading the, the, the survey data that comes out, I have not seen growth in that 19%. But what I have seen are a lot of people who were um, ambivalent, who were uncomfortable with you know, Trump, with the direction that they saw their churches or their pastors taking but couldn't quite articulate it, particularly because they had grown up in spaces where to be Christian was to vote Republican. There are so many truths that were just handed down uh, and, and taken for granted. And so what I see is those who are already uncomfortable and not all in have become emboldened, have um, a, through this book, through other resources, through other conversations, through other leaders like Beth Moore or Russell Moore, who have come out and said no to this Christian nationalism and no to the support for Trump. I've seen people now, uh, you know, grassroots, local churches within uh, you know, Christian organizations say, no, you know, this is anti-Christian, this is, and they're speaking boldly. And many of them are getting picked off and isolated. And so I am not seeing, you know, we had some survey uh, that came out just uh, maybe two, three months ago that showed that um, we see a 2% decline in people who self-identify as evangelicals, not decline, sorry, 2% of people who did in 2016 no longer do, but an influx of 6% of people who didn't identify as, self, as, as evangelical who now do. And so they are responding not to theology at all. They're responding to this Jesus and John Wayne vision of what it is to be an evangelical and saying, oh yeah, that's what I am. So you see the numbers actually strengthening in some cases. This whole point about people not responding to theology at all is so interesting. I, as you know, when we talked earlier, you know, my, my father was a Southern Baptist pastor. So I know a little bit about this tradition. And I know when I was young, 
biblical knowledge and study and arguing about the Bible was everywhere. Uh, and I think to the extent people looked at candidates, they tried to look through that. Do you get a sense that there is a lot less biblical literacy among um, evangelicals than there used to be? Maybe that's true for all of, of, of Christians or churchgoers, but mm -hmm. the ability for a people who say they're the people of the book, you know, I spent a lot of time in vacation Bible school learning about, you know, that was the center of our faith. And to ignore it in so many ways, you point out that, that really doesn't factor in. Just say a little more about that. Is it is it a decline in catechism that's part of what's going on here? Yeah, that's part of it. And I will say there still is a theological core, you know, so within SBC seminaries and, you know, organizations like the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, they'll be churning this stuff out very regularly, you know, theological takes on all sorts of issues. Uh, but there too, a lot of it, it uh, a place like the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood um, will be, you know, packaging and selling biblical manhood, which has all sorts of cultural layers on top of it. Uh, but in terms of this formation, yeah, you know, I think that evangelical kids who grew up in the, uh, you know, nineties and early two thousands, they'll talk a lot about veggie tales and adventures and odyssey, right? these cartoons and radio shows. And I mean, Christian youth groups, it was this popular culture, Kirk Cameron movies and, um, purity culture, right? So to be a Christian was to, you know, the silver ring and purity balls and a lot of talk about not having sex, right? And, and not a lot of catechism, frankly. And so, uh, and then I would also say that we have to think about evangelicalism as uh, not just a popular movement, but a populist movement and becoming increasingly so, which is to say, you'll still have leadership, you'll still have theologians, you'll still have theology happening, but what is the core identity? And especially for people who are, you know, declaring themselves evangelical today, it, it is not the theological teachings at all. It is this socio-political identity. One of the other questions I got, and this one was just uh, sent in without a name, but I thought it was interesting. And someone points out, of course, that evangelical masculinity isn't just a story about men. No. Uh, you talk some, uh, you have a whole chapter on Phyllis Schlafly, for instance, and you talk about her role throughout the book and other, but could you say a little bit more about how women have helped to prop up patriarchal Christianity and these militant ideals of Christian masculinity? Yeah, uh, this evangelical patriarchy could not be sustained without the active support of women. And so I do have a whole chapter on it. And Schlafly was actually Catholic, but very influential in evangelical spaces. I talk about Elizabeth Elliot and Meryl Bell Morgan and others. Uh, and then I had to kind of let the femininity side uh, go to, to keep with the masculinity, but I'm making up for it in my next book, which is on a white Christian womanhood. So I, I hope to pick up some of those strands, but uh, yes. So you'll have evangelical women really embrace this uh, kind of cultural femininity and, uh, and they are the ones on the front lines promoting female submission they're writing these books for how to be a good wife, um, you know, sex manuals, and uh, uh, you know, they're they're the proselytizers, really, and um, and for a variety of reasons, as I say in the book, uh, you know, they genuinely believed or were taught that this is God's word. This is how you are obedient. There is like legitimate belief at play. But there's also, if you go back to the '60s and '70s, when you have this disruption of the feminist movement. Um, it wasn't super liberating to a lot of women who were stay at home moms, who didn't have a college education, who had no real job skills to suddenly be told, go compete with men in the, in the labor market, right? There was no, no, no fulfilling work for them. And so conservative Christians were telling them, we value you as a housewife you are doing God's work and, and, and here's how you can achieve happiness as in your place, because what woman can really change her circumstances really. Right. Um, and so, so there are some practical reasons, I think too, there's religious, and then there's just the, what was possible for women given the choices they had already made or the choices that had been made for them. 
terms of other uh, traditions, also one of the questions that was sent in uh, was from uh, um, Rua Bull, who says she's a Roman Catholic and was troubled to see how many Catholics, particularly older folks, voted for Trump and wants to know what insights you have about the same appeal to Catholics. Is the John Wayne image working with them and in other traditions also? What do, what do you see on that? Yeah. So I went to the University of Notre Dame and this question is always on my mind. And I have friends who are scholars of uh, American Catholicism, and I've actually been trying to recruit one of them to write a Catholic version of Jesus and John Wayne, because uh, the story is, runs parallel, but it's not exactly the same story. Where the stories intersect most clearly is in the political realm. Right. Uh, so the rise of the religious right, that's where we see this this unity around somebody like, you know, Phyllis Schlafly is an important figure here. And and you see um, in terms of national politics, uh, evangelicals and Catholics coming together, which was strange right? in the, up until the 70s. Most evangelicals detested Catholics. And in fact, most evangelicals didn't embrace the pro-life movement. Uh, because Catholics were doing that and they detested Catholics. That was a Catholic thing. Why would we do that? Right. You know, and so over the course of the seventies is where you see this, um, uh, the Catholic and the, the conservative Catholic conservative Protestant, um, uh, kind of bonds developing around political and social issues, much more than around any theological or, or actual like community issues. Um, because Jesus and John Wayne focuses so much on popular culture, that's where you have a divergence. Because although there are some Catholic books that will appear in evangelical bookstores, very few, and Catholics have their own literature, Catholics have their own radio stations, their own, right? Uh, and so I haven't done that study. And that's what I'm trying to get somebody to do to see how does this work? in Catholic spaces and within Catholic culture, we end up in a similar place and we have the same kinds of divisions within Catholicism as we have within evangelicalism, but that story still has to be told. I see some of you all out there have written some good questions and uh, if you have a question, you wanna write it in, uh, type it in Q&A right now and I'll, I'll pull some of these and, and add them into the discussion. Um, one um, question I got in advance, uh, from Mary uh, Nesnik, and I saw someone mention it online also, was a question about the, the growth between this militant white evangelicalism and support for Israel. Um, I know you write some in your book about the impact on specific issues. You write about guns and some things. Do you have a sense of, of that there's greater support because of this? I mean, we know there is this for a number of reasons, ties between the evangelical community and what they and, and Israel, but is that one of the impacts of this an increase in that support? You think? Yeah, I mentioned it a couple of times. I could have done much more. In fact, I, I probably could have had a whole chapter on on that. Um, and uh, yes, it's part of that. Of this it, it, the kind of pro Zionist. Uh, uh, strand within American Protestantism or uh, evangelicalism in particular goes way back, right? So there's a long history there. And then you have that, um, you know, uh, kind of powerfully embraced by conservative evangelicals in particular. Um, and this is linked to the kind of charismatic and prophecy strands of, 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 you know, this broad umbrella evangelicalism. Historians sometimes divide Pentecostal charismatics from evangelicals for following the kind of survey data and, and where we are today. I, I lump them together, but they are, they are different, but I would say they are less different now than they used to be because they are all consuming the same popular culture. Evangelicals are promiscuous consumers. They will tune into a, you know, a Pentecostal televangelist on Sunday morning. And, you know, and so the divisions just aren't that stark anymore. But to get back to the Zionism, uh, that is very much a part of this evangelical popular culture. There's lots of Christian fiction written that's pro-Zionist. And I, I came across an intriguing um, suggestion that this kind of militancy was fueled during the Six Day War already. And this kind of, um, and, and so I, I didn't end up developing that. Um, there wasn't much research on that, but that's always kind of stayed in the back of my mind that I think this needing to fight for, to protect God's people 
um, is consistent across the Zionist movement and then this um, kind of Jesus and John Wayne Christianity. There's a question that came in from Nick Thornton about uh, Billy Graham, who you mentioned earlier. Um, actually, growing up, I always thought Billy Graham was fairly progressive for some of the Southern Baptists because at least he stood up on race and integrated yeah. his, you know, and but uh, obviously he was a he's a very uh, in other ways a, a very conservative figure, of course. But he asked an interesting question: uh, see the difference in approach between Billy Graham and his son Franklin. Is this a good example of the shift in what's happened in, in the evangelical community? Yes, I think that's fair. Uh, I was just talking with somebody who knew Graham earlier today, and we're, we're hashing out exactly this. Um, so uh, on the one hand, you know, if you go back to Billy Graham in the 1940s, 1950s, um, you know, he was he was an ardent Christian nationalist. Uh Absolutely. And, and then, and he was a political opportunist. He actually, you know, seriously considered running for president himself. He loved the power. He loved being in and out of the Oval Office. And I say this almost like cringing because I feel like I'm, I mean, I, I'm going to get hit by evangelicals because evangelicals have held Billy Graham up, you know, placed him on this pedestal. And, um, and I, I didn't grow up in these spaces that, that just idolized Billy Graham, but I know people who have, and it's been really interesting because for some people that is the most shocking thing in my book is this more critical assessment of Billy Graham, um, the early Billy Graham and all the way through. And, um, for me as a historian, this is just the Billy Graham. We know I didn't write to like blow up people's like, you know, images of Billy Graham. This is just who he is in the history books. And, and historians know this evangelicals have, have been very protective of telling their own story and they're very protective of Graham. So, but then what we see is Graham transitions, particularly post Watergate, uh, he becomes chastened. At Nixon's betrayal, he also becomes much more concerned about, uh, he steps back from militarism, right? By the 1980s, he's warning against nuclear war and he's really backing off. And he's warning his fellow evangelicals about this political alliance and the dangers he has learned and he is trying to impart these lessons most of them ignore him. And so he then in his older stages, you know, his old age, Billy Graham, which is what many of us remember, he's this like avuncular type and, uh, and this kind of rosy past and the real history is kind of obscured. And then, yeah, uh, his son, Franklin is a great example of kind of taking the more problematic aspects of his, his, of his dad's earlier years and then just running with it and absolutely seems to be uncontrolled, untempered, and uh, is, is uh, kind of a, a great example of this more populist and popular right-wing evangelicalism. Recall, an, um, I, I think an interview I read with you where you said that your um, editor wanted you to put something a little more positive at the end of the book, a little more hopeful and you didn't add a whole lot. You had one sentence about what has been done can be undone. Having been in this and seen all the reaction, um, do you have a, a, a word of optimism about uh, uh, changes in this community and American Christianity in general? Or, or do you see a, a path that we should be following and sort of uh, to emphasize to try to get beyond this kind of uh, cultural Christianity you're talking about here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was not very hopeful when I finished the book and. Well, you're uh, a historian. It's your job to uh, get us to understand what happened, but. We are not the know. most hopeful people. We, <laughs> we know too much. Um, so, um, right. And, and he said, you, you can't leave your readers here. Like it's, you're, 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 you're being too cruel to your readers. You've got to give them something to hold on to. And I was like, I, I, this is all I've got. Um, and so I gave him the last sentence, what was once done might also be undone. And, um, at the time it felt very feeble, uh, and I was embarrassed and he's like, fine, I'll take it. And that was that. And uh, so, uh, but, but it is true. It is true that if you know this history, especially within white evangelical spaces, where so much is just assumed as God ordained as traditional, as it has always been this way and therefore always will be. 
what I can do, what any historian can do is say, things have not always been the way they are now. And let me show you how this came to be, right? Again, change over time. And then that does not say how things ought to be. It just helps them to ask, is this how we want things to be? And, and maybe take a fresh look at those scriptures for these Bible believing Christians, right? So am I optimistic? I am hopeful when I look at individuals, right? I am, I am very inspired by the courage that I see on an individual level. Some, some top folks, you know, that get a lot of press, but also, and especially people you will never hear of people who are standing up, who are, um, alienating family members. It's incredibly difficult. The, these rifts run right through families and through churches. They are losing their jobs. Uh, and I see this and it is, it is, um, it is deeply troubling. I get these stories every day and it is also inspiring. I'm not hopeful. I'm not, I'm supposed to end with some sort of a note of hope. Here's why I'm not. Um, again, I don't see the shift in institutions. And what I see, um, is, uh, uh concerning anti-democratic shifts within evangelicalism, because it's one thing to, when you think you have the numbers on your side to support American democracy, when you see those statistics about demographic change, um, and you think that it is your special task to keep America Christian and that God will punish all of us, right? If, if America strays, then what are you going to value more? Uh, democracy and voting rights? Do you want people to vote who are going to vote against God's will? For many, more than I would have thought five years ago, the answer is no. And so I am, I'm actually very concerned about, you know, when you look at the Supreme Court, look at um, uh, voting rights, look at um, the state of our, of our government. Uh, it's, it's actually very concerning. So sorry. Following up on that, um, uh, Peter Weiner wrote a piece in the Atlantic uh, back a few months ago that got a fair amount of attention. You're widely quoted in the in the article. It's called uh, "The Evangelical Church is Breaking Apart." I, I recommend it to everyone as a, a look at some of the issues you talk about. I think we're going to put the link in the yeah. in the chat, but you can find it easily. And he quotes um, someone as saying. Uh, that the divisiveness in the church, especially among evangelicals, is a generational catastrophe, meaning that young evangelicals are being turned off and they're leaving in droves. Wondering what you've seen about that and wondering also just is this generational catastrophe worse than with other churches? Because we know that most denominations, not just evangelicals, are 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 losing many young people. Your your sense of that is there a generational catastrophe taking place with uh, evangelicals? Yes and no. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, uh, I've been hearing about this. You know, uh, the this it, it was a, not catastrophe, but very serious problem within evangelicalism for more than two decades. Right. So this is a perennial thing uh, where you have young evangelicals who do end up leaving. Um, or who, who hold more progressive values. And then somehow uh, either they leave and they're um, you know, no longer those progressive voices in, in these spaces, or they somehow grow up to be older evangelicals and become more conservative. I don't know. So, so I always take that, you know, it, it, sometimes it feels a little bit like wishful thinking as we're on the cusp of change, we're on the cusp of change. And, you know, the, the, the end of, conservative evangelicalism is nigh. I've been hearing that for decades now. So grain of salt there that said, yes, um, yeah, evangelicals have traditionally done better than other religious demographics in holding on to their young people. And that is eroding now. And, um, so you, you see, um, evangelicals leaving churches and now exacerbated by COVID, um, right. Where just people are leaving churches and young people are leaving churches and you have a, a pretty stark divide around some of these conservative political values, particularly on immigration, climate change, and LGBTQ, not so much on abortion. 
And so that divide is real. Um, people like, you know, Pete Weiner are, are trying to like call their fellow evangelicals to, Hey, you know, this is an evangelism thing. Stop, you know, what you're doing. Don't be so, so radical. Um, think of your children. It's not a very effective strategy, I would say, because so many of the people, um, that he's trying to convince, um, their Christianity is this right-wing politics, right? It's so enmeshed that to give up any of these causes is in a sense to compromise their faith. A couple of questions here. We're getting near the end, just a uh, time for a few more things. And, and then I wanna offer you a chance in a minute to make some closing comments, whatever you wanna highlight from our discussion. But a couple of just questions about what can we do to, um, uh, if you will, recapture the faith, uh, picking up on your title. And Beth Braxton asked, there have been a couple of other similar, how do we more white liberal mainline uh, church uh, Christians engage with the white evangelicals on, on the truth of the gospel? Is there a common ground? Um, and or just generally, I guess, the question how to uh, approach um, and, and, and partner, and are there ways to, to do that or to support perhaps those evangelicals who are resisting the kind of thing you're talking about. Uh, and then a question someone else asked just to mention too, uh, Lynn Shabman at uh, New York Avenue asked about, the, the media seems to be obsessed with stories of this kind of John Wayne Christianity. And how do we, how do we get away from that? How do we get the attention of a media system that loves the kind of stuff that evangelicals do because it's good copy? Yeah, sorry. I, I'm aware that I've contributed to that uh, the last year and a half too. But um, oh, really good questions. Uh, so, what what can liberal mainliners do? Um, it's I, I think that argument doesn't change people, right? We know that um, relationships do. And um, for many conservative evangelicals, uh, their communities are so tight. You know, they have their churches, they have their small groups that they that they connect to. They might send their kids to Christian school or homeschool, right? So their um, their social orbits are often, not always, but in many cases, just um, very evangelical. And so to have those relationships, to talk across you know, these uh, religious differences and not to argue, but to, to find that common ground to connect. And honestly, some, you know, I grew up in a conservative space where I heard that, you know, mainliners weren't Christians and that mainline churches were just glorified social clubs. That's what I thought. That's what I learned. And then to my great shock, when I got to graduate school, um, and, and especially starting to study the history of progressive Christianity and progressive Methodism, beautiful theology there, beautiful theology linked with social activism. And then I learned about the black church, right? Like totally not a part of my, my experience growing up, my knowledge base, gorgeous, gorgeous theology and lived experience of the faith. And so I think the more that we, um, but we have segregated ourselves, certainly racially, but also, you know, in this polarized moment. So the, the, as much as we can find those spaces and then not enter them and, you know, say hi and grab a cup of coffee and then wait five minutes and then jump in, you know, to like hash out the differences just to be, and to show that you are a good person and that you maybe love the scriptures if you are a Christian, right. Or, or, you know, from, and, and that you value your family and other people's families and these things, because there are such caricatures out there in these spaces. I honestly think that the most effective thing is we have to work in our, in real life spaces to reach across differences. It's going to take a ton of work and it's not going to be an instant result and you may never see the result, but we have to work on that. Very good. Appreciate those uh, comments and uh, and a good um, summary of how to think about the challenge we face. Um, before we close, I want to do just a couple of things, and uh, I do want to invite everyone. You've been watching this. You've been uh, asking some good questions, putting some comments in chat. Uh, I want to pose 
sort of the question, uh, some version of I just uh, posed to Dr. DeMay uh, for you to respond to. Uh, uh, and that is, uh, uh, type into chat if you would, as we are concluding here and um, answers to this question. In, in light of what you've heard tonight, what, what should we do? What are, and that can be individually. Is there an action item you see for yourself? Uh, are there issues that come to mind uh, we ought to work on? Is there a particular approach we ought to have towards uh, uh, other Christians who have uh, a different view of things than we do, but maybe there's some commonality that just in light of what you've heard tonight, what, what should we do? What should what do you say that personally and or to your congregation and those around you? Just take a, some moments and uh, type in some answers. I invite you all to look at the answers. It's very interesting to see the comments, someone already there talking about learning how to talk across divide, cultivating friendships, echoing what Dr. DeMay said about building uh, uh, relationships and connections. So continue to type these in and I encourage you to look at those and we'll leave the chat open for a little while even after we uh, close uh, for anything there. Um, I wanna share just uh, a couple of uh, announcements uh, and uh, also to remind you about Dr. Uh, Dumay's book. Uh, if you have not read it, uh, you've been hearing about it. Hopefully tonight you are encouraged even more to want to, uh, to read it. And uh, I really do urge you to get it. It's an excellent history of uh, uh, what has happened with the white evangelical culture of the last several decades and, and about our culture in general. I think you'd find it uh, very interesting. Um, and it's available, of course, online in a whole variety of ways and urge you to uh, get a copy and read it as you, as you can. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements and then I wanna share a couple of short quotes uh, to close, which I do think point at some of the things that Dr. DeMay was uh, talking about when she talked about how we respond to this. Um, the first thing is that um, the New York Avenue Presbyterian will continue discussion of Dr. DeMay's book this Sunday at 9 a.m. during the uh, uh, adult education hour at the church. It'll be in the Lincoln parlor at the church for those of you who know um, the, um, our, our physical facility, but you also can attend online. And if you go to the New York Avenue uh, website, nyapc.org, you click on uh, upcoming events, and you'll see some events there and you can register. So you can participate even if you're one of those people from out of town and across the country, uh, you can join in the discussion online. It'll be a sort of hybrid meeting. So uh, we invite you to do that. Uh, and then the other announcement uh, is that our next program uh, will be Wednesday evening, May 11th. Uh, and this will feature Jim Wallace, who many of you know and are familiar with the founder of the Sojourners community, Sojourners magazine. And he just finished 50 years at Sojourners. And Jim is now with the new Center for Faith and Justice at Georgetown. And we are intending this be our first in-person meeting uh, since February of 2020. And we are looking forward to that. We will have an online component. Uh, there is an ability you'll be able to join uh, online if you're not able to come, but we're hoping uh, many of you will come down and, uh, and hear uh, Jim Wallace interact with him. We'll be sending you more details on that, but that's uh, May 11th for the next McClendon Scholar Program uh, with uh, Jim Wallace. I mentioned earlier uh, this article uh, by uh, Pete, Pete Weiner in the Atlantic. I do commend it to you if you want to look more on this, and he he cites several people in there worth knowing about uh, in addition to uh, Dr. Dumay and her insights. And I wanna share two short quotations from that article as a way of closing uh, here. Uh, the first is from Reverend Scott Dudley, who is a Presbyterian pastor in uh, Bellevue, Washington. And uh, uh, Pete Weiner quotes him as saying, I understand that some act as they do because they believe everything they value is under assault. I feel under assault sometimes too. 
However, I also know that the early Christians transformed the Roman Empire not by demanding, but by loving, not by angrily shouting about their rights in the public square, but by serving even the people who persecuted them, which is why Christianity grew so quickly and took over the empire. I also know that once Christians gained political power under Constantine, that beautiful, loving, sacrificing, giving, transforming church became the angry, persecuting, killing church. We have forgotten the cross, Reverend Dudley says. And then just the final comments that Pete made in his article. Uh, we had Pete Wainer, many of you remember, a uh, couple of times as a McClendon scholar. And um, I commend all that he writes to you. I think he's uh, insightful, particularly about what's happening in the evangelical church. And here are the words he closes his article with. He says, something has gone amiss. Pastors know it as well as anyone and better than most. The Jesus of the Gospels, the Jesus who won their hearts and who long ago won mine, needs to be reclaimed. Jesus now has to be reclaimed from his church, from those who pretend to speak most authoritatively in his name. Thank you for joining us and um, good night.